Hey, fat heads! Welcome to another episode of Pipe Dummies. I am your guest co-host, Cigar Surgeon. You're probably expecting Rob, but Rob is busy tonight, so I'm an extra dummy tonight to fill in for him. I'm here with your regular host, Logan. As always, Logan, what is going on, brother? Um, dude, not a whole lot. Um, it's getting hot down here in Austin. I uh, just got back from Cigar Safari uh, Sunday. It's good. And yeah, man, life, life, life is great, surgeon. Life is, life is freaking great. Man, I wish I'd been on the cigar safari with you guys. That would have been pretty awesome. Yeah, you definitely dropped the ball on that one. I told you, man. Hey, but it's okay. Just it, need to realize that I'm always right and always you're right. always wrong. There's a reason why you're the MFN CEO, and I'm that, just. That's why I run this bitch, surgeon. There's a reason. It didn't happen <laughs> by accident. So, uh, of course, uh, I am extra dummy, but I am uh, cracking out my. Uh, my dummy pipe and trying it out, and uh, you know, trying to trying to learn what I can learn. But we're not really talking about us tonight. We're really not talking about uh, pipe tobacco, as uh, our audience out there can. Well, not our podcast audience because you guys are listening. But uh, we have a special guest tonight from Batson Pipes, Grant Batson, joining us. Grant, what is going on, man? How are you guys? Man, just kicking it, ready for you to school us. Because, like, like I've told you over email, we don't know crap about pipes. We're here to bridge the gap between hardcore cigar nerds and the pipe world. And we are the conduit, but you are the subject matter experts. So we're ready for you to drop some knowledge on us about really anything we want. We talked about, you know, pipe, how to care for your pipe, you know, the anatomy of a pipe, how to make a pipe, everything. So, we're just pumped, man. I'm, I'm excited. Well, cool. I'm I'm. I'm pretty excited to be here too. I uh, I love, I'm a cigar guy too, so this is like, you know, if, if this ends up going in a cigar direction, like corral me back in because I've I've been a big cigar dude for a long, long time. Um, well, what do you want to talk about first, man? I I mean, I, you know, yeah. experts a scary word. You know, I I I try to avoid. Uh, you know, yeah, that I mean, whole... I, I mean, but you are an expert. For the people that are listening right now, I mean, you, and just so everyone knows, maybe give a little bit of background on, you know, your your background in kind of the pipe world, I, you know, about how you kind of make pipes, how you got started, so people can understand why you really are an expert and you're just being modest. He really is. If you checked out his website at gbatsandpipes.com, you would recognize that he is just being modest. Well... I appreciate that. Um, but, you know, I've been, I started smoking a pipe pretty casually when I was 19 years old. I was in college. Uh, I'm, I'm from the Austin, Texas area. I moved to Nashville. To, yeah, I, that's uh, pretty I cool. I didn't, I didn't know you were from there. Logan. Yeah. So, came to Nashville, went to, went to school, and uh, bought a really cheap pipe. And found a pipe shop in in Nashville called Uptowns, which uh, been around for a very long time. Um, and got some Lane One Q, yep. and you know went to town. Just went to town. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. So um, then when eBay kind of you know the when Al Gore inter- invented the internet, I love it. Shortly what a great that was. Uh, eBay became this big phenomenon, so um, I started buying. That this is back when eBay was legit. You know, you could find some super killer deals for cheap on eBay. So I started finding these lots of pipes, and there might be twenty or thirty or forty crappy estate pipes in a box and they would take all these terrible photos of them and it might be 20 or 30 bucks and you get all the pipes and I would say well you know what there's two pipes in, in there that look cool and it's worth 40 bucks for me to buy the whole bunch of them <clears throat> so I got them and uh, I was probably maybe 22, 23 somewhere in that area uh, at this time and then uh you know, I I didn't really know what I was doing. You know, I think I think that's it, that's the case for most dudes that 
start smoking pipes, they, they think, man, that's that looks like a cool thing to do. Or my grandfather did that. Or my dad gave me an old pipe that he used to have when he was, you know, 20 or whatever. And so for whatever reason, we smoke a pipe and we don't know what we're doing. And we have friends that also don't know what they're doing, and they're the ones that are teaching us. <clears throat> so it really took me a long time to kind of figure out how the hell do you actually do this? Because it was it was so frustrating. I was very sporadic with my pipe smoking for many years, and uh, which is actually how I got into cigars. Because my best friend at the time, um, I kept trying to get him. You know, I had I, I had tons of pipes because I was buying these big lots, and <laughs> so I would start giving them to my friends so that they would smoke a pipe with me, and. And I even started this little club and had it in my in my basement. In my I had a little shop, a woodworking shop in my basement, and trying to get buddies to come and join my little pipe club. And and I'd give them a pipe as an incentive to come over and like, smoke with me. And most of them thought it was cool. And anyway, um, so fast forward a little bit, I kind of got into cigars because one of my buddies was like, "Dude, this pipe." thing is a joke. This sucks. You know, it's can't keep it lit. It's like got nasty juice in my mouth. Like, you know, dude, smoke you you need to smoke a cigar. So he quickly got me into cigars and uh, I got heavily into cigars for a long time. There were probably you know two or three years where I don't even touch a pipe. And uh, then I, I I got back into it gradually, but really truthfully, it was just a few years before started making pipes that kind of learned how to smoke a pipe and started enjoying it again. Um, to kind of give you a background of, I guess, I guess why I'm uh, the, the so-called expert, what, what, how I got into making pipes. Um, when I graduated from college, I did the natural thing, which was to flush my education down the toilet. <laughs> and get a job at a custom furniture cabinet shop because okay. that sounds cool and I really didn't want to go into public relations and marketing. So I graduated, got a job at this woodworking shop and um, my brother got a job there as well and uh, he had uh, we, we grew up playing music. We, were, we had garage bands uh, growing up, and he was a great drummer, and I played the guitar. And um, I had just sold a, a 67 Mustang uh, so that I could buy a really stupid, expensive guitar. Um, then I had to find a car uh, to go pick the guitar up. Right. <laughs> but it was, a, it was a really good decision, though, uh, I assure you. Um, should have been getting the honeys to drive you around with the fancy. Yeah, car. right. Well, I, I, actually, the, the full story is that uh, I was in search of this guitar for a while, and um, I was also about to get married, and so I knew that, hey, dude, you better buy that expensive guitar now, because as soon yeah. as you do, that will never happen. <laughs> Be locked down. Yeah. So... Um, so I'd saved up a little bit of money, but when I found this guitar, it was twice as expensive. It was in the thousands. Oh. It was over three thousand dollars. <laughs> so I'd saved up about fifteen hundred dollars, but um, the guitar that I found that I had to have, I couldn't afford. So that's when I sold the car, came up with the rest of the money for the guitar, and then the rest of the money I bought a, an engagement ring. So um, my my wife still. Uh, asks me from time to time which was more expensive. She doesn't, you know, I, I, I plead the fifth on that. Um, <laughs> so, so I got I bought this guitar, and I promise this is actually going somewhere. It's not just no, no, this is good, man. That's that a great story. So, uh, my brother and I working at this shop. He had been playing the guitar as well. He, my brother's he's brilliant. He, he can do just about anything. He can make anything. He can play all kinds of instruments. Um, so he was getting into guitar and didn't have, you know, 
few nickels to rip together. So I had just bought this fancy guitar, which was he was incredibly envious of. So he decided, man, I'm going to make a guitar. You know, we're working at this woodworking shop. We've got tools and piles of wood everywhere, and so I and I had made a, a guitar, an electric guitar, in ag shop in a shop class in high school. It was a really total piece of crap, but um, it you could plug it in and it made sounds, you know. But uh, so I kind of laughed. I was like, dude, you you don't even know what you're getting into. Uh, he wanted to make an acoustic, which is quite a bit more lofty uh, of, a, of a goal, ambition, uh, than electric. So, anyway, long story short, he got into making guitars after hours and on weekends, and I started helping him. I started helping him design stuff. For, for the large part, though, I was just really observing him, just kind of pitching in where I could. So, for about a decade, he was doing this building guitars, and I was helping him as much as I could, and um, we ended up turning that into a business. And uh, so, for um, a number of years, we we owned a, a custom acoustic guitar company called Bats and Guitars, and it's still in existence today. My brother Don does it. Um, but about four years ago, I I just needed a change of scenery. I had. I mean, we had been making guitars um, and pursuing the dream, I should say, of making guitars for a living for 15 years, and it was just a struggle. And, um, you know, he was really getting to do the fun part because he was primarily the overseeing the make manufacturing, and I was kind of running the business end of things. So um, my contribution on the making the fun part was minimal, and uh, so I left the business to him and didn't have a clue what I was going to do you know, when I grew up. So, uh, st I, in fact, I still don't. Um, <laughs> it, it, hopefully, I'll, I'll get to you know keep making pipes for a little bit. But um, so we we kind of we parted ways, and uh, there was a, a very uh, well-known and, and extremely talented pipe maker who had asked me to build him a display case for some pipes. So uh, I took him up on that offer because it was a paying gig and I didn't have one of those at the time. So one thing led to another and he said, man, you should make pipes. You'd probably be really good at making pipes. I'll teach you how to do it. And, and I looked at him and I said, honestly, Looks pretty boring, and <laughs> be boring. And he said, "Well, man, you got to try it." So I did, and I loved it. I was totally wrong. It was super fun, and so that kind of started my my pipe making endeavor. Now, this was one month to the day before the 2012 Chicago Pipe Show. So he was getting me to come into the shop. 14, 16, 18 hour days for a month Whew. making pipes so that I'd have pipes to sell the show, yeah. Yeah, right. And I needed to do it because I was broke. I, I've got four <laughs> kids and wife and you know, I was just trying to figure out what I was going to do for, for money, you know, and, and looking for jobs uh, at the same time and and my wife was very skeptical. She, she kept saying, you know, you are actually well, you're making pipes. You're paying for this, right? Job, right. You you are actually <coughs> pursuing a, a real career, right? Um. So, I went to the Chicago Pipe Show. I sold my pipes, made some money, and thought, well, that was pretty cool. Maybe I should consider doing it again next year. Well, you know, then then I started finding out about all the other pipe shows. So I started making more pipes, and it, you know. It was a struggle, but ultimately that's kind of what led me here. I mean, it, it, it's just kind of a, you know, I don't really know. There's not really any more exciting uh, words to throw at the, the rest of the story. You know, it just, so far it hasn't fallen apart. So uh, here I am making pipes, and... Um, 
That's cool. So let me ask you, I mean, trade show-wise, I'm very familiar with the cigar trade show, which is IPCPR, which is kind of the big daddy, and then Inner Tobacco is for Europe and Germany. You know, how, how like, I know there's Chicago Pipe Show, and then there's New York, and then I think there's Kansas City, and, but which one's, like, the big daddy? And how does it work? Is it consumers can go or just, you know, retail tobacconists that are buying their products for the year? How does that the shows typically work? Well, yeah, they're quite a bit different from your bigger trade shows like IPCPR and all that. Um, Chicago Pipe Show for the U.S. is definitely the biggest one. So, um, you know, there's probably a couple of thousand people that come. And oh, okay. Mostly they're collectors uh, and just pipe enthusiasts. So you have a sea of flat tables and a big, you know, resort, hotel, convention center kind of a building and there's just pipes and pipe accessories as far as I can see and it's just all on a level you know, flat field. So there's no there's no like real spectacles, like there's no you know, uh, Brooklyn Bridge Yeah, there's um, no true estate yeah. right. so, uh, Slightly different crowd Yeah, it is a different crowd for sure um, you know there are a lot of fanny packs and fishing vests there. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Lots of kilts. Um, you know, it, you know the pipes. The pipe guys are a really interesting. I love the the personalities. They, they, it's a real interesting group of people. But uh, in terms of who comes, it, it's not really. I don't exactly know the history of them, but I do get the strong sense that they're geared for the consumer. Okay. Um, you have re a lot of retailers that are there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like distributors will come and they'll at the end of the show they'll typically buy up pipes and accessories from you know the makers. But uh, for the most part the, the pipe makers are there to sell direct to pipe nerds. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So is there tobacco? I mean, is there pipe tobacco, or is it purely just pipes? Oh no, there's tons of pipe tobacco. Okay. Yeah, all kinds. So you can come, you can sample stuff all day long, and um, there's a lot of really cool, interesting stuff that they they even have like a a pipe making class. They've got a, really? a slow smoking competition, um, different seminars on all kinds of different things. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff at the shows, uh, particularly. Okay. Chicago, uh, there. I don't think there are any pipe making classes at any of the other shows, but uh, okay. And that's coming up. Is it just happened, or is it already happened? It, it was the same weekend as uh, Cigar Fest. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So um, it just happened a few weeks ago. So the next one that's coming up is uh, a, a month from now in yep. Kansas City, and it's a pretty nice. Yep. Decent size show as well. Uh, the club there is very active. They do a lot of uh, really. Um, they they put out a really great newsletter every month, and um, they put on a really interesting show. They've got a lot of cool stuff. They they have a carving contest, and, really? and the winners are get seven handmade pipes in a big display set. No shit. Okay. Yeah, pretty cool. Um, so yeah, there are quite a few shows. The Columbus, there's a Columbus show I think in August. Um, it's a good show. Um, the Southern Fried Pipe Club here in Nashville putting the Nashville Pipe Show on in September. There's one in New Orleans in October. One in uh, Vegas, the West Coast Pipe Show in November. There's it seems like there's a show every month. Okay. So yeah. okay, got it. So okay, very cool. So you know. When it comes down to since pipe making is kind of your forte, like in a you know in a pipe, I mean you have your bowl, you have the stem, but you know break down some of the components you know of the actual pipe, like what makes it work, like I mean any kind of knowledge you want to drop on that. Yeah. I mean I know there's different types of stems. I mean just just tell us about the anatomy of a pipe. Okay, well. So, you know, you've got you've got the the this is considered the bowl. Okay. 
the chamber is inside. It's typically roughly three quarters to seven eighths. It could be it can be smaller than that. Three quarters diameter is average. Um, this this here is the shank. Okay. And then this is this is the stem. Uh, this little guy here, this would be called a a, a flared saddle. Uh, the little um, I don't know if you can see it very well, but so this this is a flare. Uh, Where it looks like the UFO. Yeah, this guy here. This is the button. So the button, on yeah. on the on the mouthpiece on the stem, the little uh, football shaped guy here. That's that's the button. Now as far as what to answer your question in terms of anatomy, what makes a pipe work? Basically, it's as simple as you have a big hole and you have a tiny hole and they're connected. That's a pipe. I think by definition that's a pipe. If you've got two holes that connect, you can smoke something out of it. So okay. um, the draft hole is that smaller hole that goes you know, down, down from inside here to connect to the bottom. And uh, good pipes you, you definitely. It's it's funny. You would think that a pipe is a pipe. Right. You got a big hole. You got a small hole. Like what's what's the difference between a good pipe and a bad pipe, or you know, whatever. So yeah. And that has to do with diameter of holes. Okay. Uh, it has to do with the alignment. If you have something that's off center in one way or another. Uh, if you're if you're if you're looking down inside of a, of a tobacco chamber, and that draft hole, the small hole coming down, if it's way lower than the bottom of the of the tobacco chamber, or if it comes in high and there's a lot of a uh, chamber left down mm -hmm. below it, uh, you're going to have issues with with condensation, gurgling, um, it's just a bad thing. And then uh, you've also got what uh, the internals of this, of the mouthpiece, uh, are actually very important. So in a, in a high-grade pipe, in, in a pipe that's handmade, in fact, it doesn't matter if it's handmade or factory-made, really a good, a pipe's going to smoke way better if this slot here. A lot of times you'll see a pipe that's got a little slit here across. Yep. But if you look deep into it. It's actually it, just a circle. It's just there's just a it's like decoration. It doesn't right. do anything. So you know having it actually machined out so that you're basically taking that round hole and flattening the hole but so, but you've got the same amount of volume that can pass. It's not a bottleneck. Suddenly, it goes yeah. from a to a tiny one, and then you're like, you know, it's like a tight draw on a cigar. You know, it's just right. not not very fun to smoke. Um, so those are some of the key things. You know, a thinner button here is, uh, or the thickness of the of the mouthpiece right behind this football shape, the button, uh, is is key. Uh, you really want to for yeah. gas expansion or no? It's actually it's just for comfort. You know, it, you know if you're if you're holding a pipe in your mouth, you know, for me, if I'm going to smoke a cigar, I'm going to smoke a cigar. If I'm going to smoke a pipe, I don't want it to feel like a 60 ring gauge cigar in my mouth. You know, <laughs> and it, and it really makes a difference. Uh, you you'd be surprised at, at what taking a little bit of thickness up there can do for comfort. Um, so you know, those are kind of the nuts and bolts of it. Um, It's hard. Okay. It's hard to do it without, you know. We should have done a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna get an audience question in here before uh, yeah. before Logan gets another one because we get we actually have quite a quite a few audience questions. Yeah, knock out some audience questions. Um, so I think the first and most important here, and and I actually had this question as well for you, Grant, was, and Harley Holmes Harley Holmes wants to know what is your favorite material to work with. Um, well, the briar is my favorite material. I mean, it's uh, you know, so all 
all the pipes that I make, well, I shouldn't say all. I make a few pipes out of Morta, which is a, a bog oak, really, really old bog oak. But 99.9% .9 of the pipes I make are all Italian briar. Briar is the root, it's a root ball of a little scrub brush conifer tree called the white heath. And it grows only in the Mediterranean, so it's it grows all all around the Mediterranean. You can get it from Algeria, uh, Corsica, Italy, Greece, you know, everywhere. Um, and it grows in the foothills, and these guys go up there and they they dig it out of the foothills, and uh, a truck will come along and he'll pay that guy for the briar, and they'll throw these roots into the truck, and then that guy drives it to a briar cutter. And he sells those to the briar cutter, and the briar cutter cuts them and cures them, ages them, all that. Uh, so, bri it, briar, it's a really dense wood. It, it, it has properties that um, are really good for uh, for lighting on fire, really. <laughs> you know, um, it's, kind of, it's kind of funny that we're smoking, we're, we're basically picking a, a Tobacco leaf and a piece of wood, and then lighting that on fire. Uh, you want one of them to burn, not the other one, but they're both combustible. But uh, so briar just has properties that really are optimal for lighting on fire, basically. So, uh, but it's fun to work with. Uh, the grain is really interesting, and uh, it's truth truthfully my favorite part of pipe making is the shaping of the pipes. Uh, there are a lot of elements that go into making a pipe, but but that material uh, for me is the it's the fun one. Now, like a chunk of briar, because this is coming over. I'm, you said it's not grown locally, so it has to come over from the Mediterranean. I mean, what is a typical block, a raw block of briar, without disclosing your cost? What what does that run somebody? Man, it's all over the map. Uh, you can get some if you've got a connection with the briar cutter who make you know, what they do for a living, and he'll sell them to you. Uh, you can find like the really factory grade stuff uh, for as little as you know a few bucks for a block. Now those aren't they're not going to be very good. They're probably going to have all kinds of issues, uh, but and then they can go all the way up to. Seventy-five, eighty dollars a block. Good God! Wow. Yeah. And that block is going to get you what? One single pipe? Most of the time. Wow. Yeah. That's nuts. So the guys that are making the really high quality stuff, they're buying the really good stuff. Like, I have a question on the briar. I mean, what makes the difference between a good piece of briar? and a bad piece of briar because unfortunately not making pipes myself I mean I've got a few right I mean I've got a little Savinelli I got a little Stanwell I can't see inside the pipe I don't know what makes it better or, or worse or whatever what are the quality or characteristics of briar that when you see it in its raw form you know that wow this is a really good piece versus this is a really shitty piece well there, there are actually a handful of different elements to it um, one of the things that you know, just in picking up different blocks, you can tell how dense or, you know, how heavy, how light the pipe is. Um, and actually, the, the weight of it doesn't necessarily make it a good or bad uh, block of briar. Typically, though, the lighter blocks are the, are the, are the better blocks for sandblasting because um, okay. the, the, the density... Is is less, and so you're you're going to have a little bit better opportunity to uh, blast away the material to get the good you know green grain look. But also, uh, the more dense blocks, a lot of times they're dense because their grain is closer together. So you actually have like a lot more. It'd be like a cigar that you know just wouldn't properly build. There's not enough filler in there, and it's really you know spongy versus a you know one that they just packed a ton into. So you've got blocks of briar that are super full of, of grain you know, per square inch or whatever you want to call it. So, right. um, And what tends to happen in, uh, is you, you buy briar from cutters that you trust, that you know they, they 
age it and then mature it and they cure it the right way because if it's not done the right way uh, that will cause some problems uh, but also um, those guys that are really good at it know how to read that block and they know if they're gonna if they're cutting a, a burl pretty quickly they can tell if this thing's gonna be chock full of flaws, fissures and pits and cavities and they'll they'll do appropriately appropriately with that. So you can get blocks from people that don't have the ability or don't care and you're gonna have all kinds of problems. So if I'm carving a pipe, I might carve away a bunch of pits and fissures in a pipe and finally get it to where it's clean. It looks really good. But I don't know if somewhere right between the you know the, the walls of this chamber there's some big cavity there. Right. Mm -hmm. So trust in your briar cutter and 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 time at time in the saddle of, of working with the stuff and kind of getting, getting to understand the briar is pretty crucial because uh, you know if you have a, a cavity in there it'll burn out so you'll have you'll end up you know, just completely ruining that pipe so um, the last thing I would say about in choosing the briar and the, the, the expense of it and what kind of differentiates different grades of briar is that uh, it's an aesthetic element so smooth pipes tend to be smooth because they don't have a lot they don't have as many pits and fissures in them Mm -hmm. But also the grain is a lot tighter and, and therefore more aesthetically pleasing. So the prettier pipes are the smooth pipes usually, and they're usually yeah. more expensive. So there you so, go. So okay, so you're saying something like this, like this Savinelli here, that's really smooth, probably yeah. was something that didn't have a lot of craziness going on with it. Like I yeah. mean, it was pretty straightforward. Or if you've got some stuff like this, which is a you know, a cheap freaking thing you got off wherever. It's got like holes in it, and it probably was full of just issues. Well, maybe. Or maybe. But I mean, look at that thing. I mean, I don't know if you can see it, but it's got like weird cracks in it. Oh, yes. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I thought that was done on purpose, but apparently no. it wasn't. <laughs> no, and not, I didn't know. Hey, I'm a pipe dummy. I don't know. Well, and you'll find like a lot of the cheaper factory pipes uh, actually. Right. Some of them that aren't so cheap, some of them that are over $100, you'll find, if you look at them really carefully, they put wood filler in holes and cracks. and No joke. And, well. it and it blends in really nicely, and you can't see it unless you're really looking for it. But, but filling holes in a pipe, it's just really a no-no. Like, especially on the, the artisan level, doing what I do. And if there's a, in fact, if there's a, if there's a pit in it, you know, you you have to investigate that, and you have to make a conscious decision uh, if it's even worth finishing. You know, maybe right. it's just going to be an aesthetic, very superficial. Uh, mo a lot of times it is, a lot, but a lot of times it's not. So, uh, but I don't. But if I have those, and I decide that hey, it's superficial, it's an aesthetic issue, but it's not a quality issue, I leave it there, so it's visible. People can see it, right. and. If you still want to buy it, I'm, I'm going to guarantee the pipe, you know, but but I'm not trying to hide anything is, is the point. So a lot of the the cheaper factory pipes, you know, you'll have, they'll totally hide that stuff. And, you know, maybe it'll last and smoke great for years, but that's just one of those things that when you buy a less expensive pipe, it, it may not last as long. So, I, so oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was no, going to no. say... Sweet, Sweet has a good question. I think, kind of the, the the progression of where you're taking this, and he wants to know, how do you start to make the bowl? Like, what is? I mean, obviously without going into great detail, but like, what's? Because it sounds like the bowl is is going to be the toughest place to start, and certainly, you know, if something goes wrong, you don't want to get too far into the process before you discover that. Am I, am I closer? That's actually a very good question. Um, and it's the reason that I make pipes the way that I do. A lot of guys, most guys actually, 
start off making a pipe by put chucking it up into the lathe and they drill it out first. So they've already established they're just like and just the, go for it. Yeah, they've established their internal. So they've taken hold on one sec. Just gonna grab a grab a project in work. I think will be kind of cool to see the uh, mid step here. So this is called this is called an Ebishon. Um, it is a grade two block from a uh, an, an Italian carver. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, actually, he is a carver too, but a briar cutter named Mimo, and he's kind of at the top of the food chain in terms of you're buying. Super quality briar. You go. You go to Mimo uh, traditionally. Uh, that's kind of yeah. the word on the street. So uh, this is called a uh, a plateau block. So it's actually got the. You can see hmm. kind of the the root uh, bark. This is the outside of. That's the, cool. That is very it. cool looking. Yeah. So <clears throat> when I'm, so what a lot of guys will do is they'll chuck this thing into a jaw. On, on the lathe, and they'll drill the chamber out, and then they'll rotate it, and then they'll drill the the mortise for the for the mouthpiece here, you know, yep. and the draft hole. But for me, it I well first of all, well I'll put it this way, I feel like that hems me in because like. The, to, to the question's point, if there's an issue there, I'm kind of screwed. So what I like to do is I like to go over to my shaping wheel and I shape the pipe completely first because what that what that it what it, it allows me freedom to change the shape as I'm going. So like, you know, for instance, this this is a blowfish uh, that I'm working on today. Um, it's just it's kind That's of a cool. weird, it's a weird pipe, but you can see that there are no holes in it. So uh, last week I was making a blowfish, and I was I was shaping this this part right here, and there was a huge flaw that went. I, I got into it. You couldn't see it from the outside, but as soon as you got into it, and it went all the way across through to the other side. And I was able to basically change the shape of the pipe. Now, it was a smaller pipe, obviously, but I changed the shape of the pipe and completely worked that flaw out and still had a pipe. But had I right. drilled it first and then found it, it's been firewood. It's firewood. So, so I which like is which is an expensive mistake. Yeah. Now so, we oh, go ahead, Logan. No, go ahead. I was, we were we were kind of talking offline a little bit before the show started. So you've been do you've been at this for a while now, as a guy who's extremely good at his craft, from from sort of start to finish, from you know the point where you're getting commissioned and you start work. What is what is the average amount of hours that goes into a pipe? Like, are we talking weeks? Are we talking months? Are we talking days? Days. Days. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's really not. But it depends on who you ask, you know, because, uh, you know, I do this for a living. I'm really fortunate to be able to do this for a living and feed my family doing it. And uh, but it's not common, you know. Uh, uh, I would say the majority. Of the pipe makers in the world are doing this as a hobby. They're, a, you know, financial planner or a, a truck driver or whatever, and they love making pipes and they do it on the weekends and nights and and so for for those guys, they don't have the benefit of practicing every day, which gets them faster and better. Uh, and a lot of times too, because it's not it's not a a full fledged business. And I, I don't I'm, I mean, a lot of these guys, and I don't mean any disrespect to, to these guys that are doing this at all. Uh, in fact, um, 
I tell people all the time it's probably the preferable way to do it because this is a very enjoyable hobby. Uh, but as soon as you start trading dollars for your hobby, suddenly it becomes work. Uh, yeah. Agreed. But, um, but uh, I am fortunate and blessed to be able to do this for a living. Um, but as because it's my business, I invest in a lot of tools. Uh, I invest a lot of time in uh, efficiencies, uh, planning. Um, I make a lot of tools and jigs and all kinds of things that make my life easier, make my product faster to be made and also more uh, accurate and precise to be made. And a lot of times, speed and accuracy go hand in hand. Uh, so you know, if you think about you know, using a chainsaw when a scalpel would be better, but you don't have a scalpel, all you have is a chainsaw, well, a scalpel is probably going to be a lot more precise and quick then what you're going to have, you're going to have a mess with a chainsaw, you know. So, so a lot of times just the tools and the process really has to do with how much time you have in a pipe. Um, and then you also have how complicated is the pipe. Is it a real simple pipe? Is it sandblast? Is it smooth? Uh, those things. You know, you've got a lot of adornments. You have ivory and bamboo and all that kind of stuff on it. So all those factors in. Uh, but, yeah, still you're talking about days. Um, that's cool. I mean, <clears throat> go ahead, Logan. I keep yeah. cutting you off. Yeah, I know you do. Ass, freaking Canadian. Um, so I have a question. When it comes to like pipes, right? Like, let's say you're just you know making a the handmade artisan pipe that you're making versus let's just say this Savinelli that I have here that I've never smoked. Like, it might take you days. Let's say three days, but it takes Savinelli an hour, minutes, seconds. Like, what's, I mean, describe, like, you know, obviously you've talked about, like, how, you know, the way your approach is a little bit different, which I think just being smart, right? You just don't, you, you know, you measure twice, you cut once, which is what the strategy you take versus I think other people probably take. But what is the other pieces that make your pipe, special and why does it take three days versus one day or you know maybe an hour versus three days like what else goes into it um man probably what I should do is give you a quick you want me to give you a tour of my shop yes yeah that'd that, be extremely cool I think I can do this without uh, breaking something so okay so right here this is my workbench, huh. and I've got a wee bit of scotch in the go there. Uh, yeah, it's a little uh, little whistle pig rye. Nice. Pretty good. I can't see what I'm showing you, so if I'm totally being an idiot, let me know. No, you're uh, good. So, so over here is uh, so that this is some of my briar stash is down here. I've got briar. Up here, I've got it another place way over there. Um, sorry if I'm making you dizzy. So right here is my shaping wheel. And this guy is um, it's a 36 grit sanding wheel, 7 inch diameter, and it's on a 3600 RPM motor. So it's, uh, it's moving pretty quick. Let me see if I can. It's a heater. <laughs> Good lord. <clears throat> yeah, that would take so we're not off. using like Dremel tools, like little things. Like this is like yeah, for, a legit woodworking operation. Right. That's what I shape that's what I shape my pipes with. So when I when I get a block of briar, like like this guy here, you know, I'll I'll sit down here at this wheel and I just go to town. I just start grinding away. Uh, so these are some of my buffing wheels here. Um I've got sanding wheels also um, that that I use to sand stuff. Um, I do have a drill press and a band saw and grinders. I, I again, I make a lot of my tools. Um, and then here is my my lathe. Nice, fancy. Uh, what do you turn on the lathe? Because most pipes aren't. Cylindrical, right? Like, I mean, well, they're not round. Yeah, 
Yeah, or is well, he bored inside with the the bowl with that carving it out? Yeah, I do my drilling with the lathe, really? and also, I also do, uh, turn my mouthpieces with the lathe. So, mm. so for instance, um, let me see here if I can find. Oh, well, I'll show you. Actually, there's one in the lathe right now. So this guy here. Wow. Okay. Oh, that cool. is. That's a stem. That's being turned, and I've already drilled it out. I've got the the tenon ready to fit inside the pipe, and uh, I'm what I have left to do is sand it a little bit and polish it up, and then I'll be ready to drill out the internals. Hmm. Uh, so, and you know, it's funny, you know. So, speaking of the difference again of handmade versus factory pipes. One of the biggest differences to me is handmade stems. So the mouthpiece is actually vulcanized rubber from Germany and it comes in th this is this is the this is the stuff here. It's just big rods huh. Huh. of of rubber. So you you get that stuff and you you actually have to turn it and drill it and hand file it and so I'll actually sand it down and then take rasps and files to bring it to shape and then sand it with nail files and buff it out and so so the mouthpiece here was just a big round rod of rubber that was fabricated by hand instead of huh. just a some machine injection mold, uh, and again, there's nothing wrong with the injection mold thing, but but it allows you to be a little bit more creative, a little bit more precise, a little bit more custom. Uh, you can get a little better fit, a little bit more of the internals, right? Like I buff, I actually buff and polish the inside of the, the slot, the hole inside of the mouthpiece, so that it doesn't, the friction and all doesn't have more of a propensity to grab tar and crap and hang on to it. Right. Very interesting. So yeah. when you say you're making craft pipes, like from stem to stern, they're made. Like they're yeah. not okay. Right. Yeah. So so the so the ingredients in a pipe for me when it starts is is that. <laughs> that's crazy that that's what it starts with and then it ends up looking like the pipe in your hand. That's fucking nuts. Yeah. That's fucking nuts. Okay. Surgeon, audience questions. We got tons. So, yeah, <clears throat> Jason is... Yeah, Jason Myers has a really good technical question here and I don't even know half the words he's using. So I'm just going to read it and I'm going to be an extreme yeah. dummy grant and you can just ex maybe even explain what he's asking. <clears throat> he wants to. He wants to know... Uh, what a reverse calabash pipe is, and what the advantages is of, of that design. Okay, um, so a reverse calabash has become a pretty popular thing uh, of late. Um, I have no idea what that is. Okay, so a reverse calabash. Um, I have one somewhere, but I don't know where it is. Uh, a reverse calabash is basically. Well, let's start with what a calabash is. So, a calabash... <clears throat> it's like Pipe Tutorial 101 here. I don't know. So, this... This is a calabash. Oh, that is a nice-looking pipe. Okay, so... Uh, what a calabash... What, Sherlock what, Holmes. Yeah, exactly. Totally. Sherlock Holmes. What, what makes it a calabash is that this... This bowl here... What? Is That's removed. crazy. So, so you put the, the tobacco in the chamber here, and then this here is just a big hollowed out cooling chamber. Hmm. So it allows, the concept is to really kind of allow that smoke to do something in there, cool down. I'm not even sure what all the reasons are for it, but people swear by them, they love them, they say, you know, some guys that's all they want to smoke is a calabash 
Um, so what a reverse calabash is then is they're basically making a regular pipe. Uh, so, so like this pipe here. Um, So we'll have the, the regular chamber, you know, and then in here, on the stem side, they'll actually hollow that cooling chamber out in here. So you've got a little oh, a little draft hole connecting the tobacco chamber and the cooling chamber. So it's reversed because instead of the cooling chamber being right underneath the bowl, it's actually on the opposite side of the pipe. So it's like a Peterson system, kind of. Yeah, it's a system pipe. Um, you know, there, there's, uh, there are uh, some people have made things that they call the arrow uh, or tubo, um, but basically, yeah, it's just a system pipe. It's, it's the whole idea is to have it uh, allow for a cooler, drier smoke. Okay. Yeah. I learned something new. That's very cool. Yeah. So, do you, which kind of pipe do you prefer, like in general? You know, in general, I love a straight apple. Just, okay. Just boring. I love billiards. Uh, pretty much, if Dunhill made it, like just straight and simple, I like them. That's what I smoke now. I like making, you know, this kind of crap, uh, but. Because they're fun, but you won't probably see me smoking those a whole lot. So, and it's just it's just really an aesthetic thing. Is all it is. Right. Some people some people swear that that a straight pipe smokes better than a bent. Um, man, I have both. I have straight bent. Some of them are good. Some of them aren't. I think there's a lot more to it than just if it's straight, it smokes better than if it's bent. There are a lot more variables involved. So, uh, for me, just the aesthetic of a straight, simple pipe is just—it's well, I mean, it's a delivery device. We're trying to deliver smoke into my body. You know, <laughs> I don't. It doesn't have to be fancy, people. You know. But all the pipes you make are, like, super fancy. Yeah, those are some baller pipes. I mean, there's some dead sexy yeah. pipes, though, for real. Well, thanks. So, like, when when you make a pipe, I mean, obviously there's ones that you'll make and you'll sell, and then you'll do commission pipes. Like, uh, what percentage is you making pipes versus people coming to you and say, hey, I have my husband, you know, my husband and I are, you know, it's his anniversary or our anniversary. I want to do, like, this badass pipe for him. And here he wants, like, a pink fucking stem or whatever, you know, crazy shit. Yeah, like this one. No <laughs> shit. <laughs> like this one. Yeah, um, you know, I most often, I have a list, and I go through my list every day. I know what pipes I'm making on what day, who they're for. I mean, I, I, I kind of keep it organized because... Again, this is a business for me. It's not a hobby, so I I have to stay on top of it. But I'll have a list that runs out a few months. So rarely do I take time to just make something because I want to make it. Fun. Right. But sometimes I do because you know sometimes I have a, a, a string of pipes that they weren't they either they weren't a challenge for me or I was just in a rut or whatever uh, mentally, and so I'll stop and I'll do something weird. Just to get it out of my system and kind of get the creative juices going again, uh, but for the most part, I'm I'm working on pipes that people are, are ordering. So you don't really make a pipe, and so you have enough business where you're working off orders, custom orders, basically the entire time. That's cool. Yeah. And Grant, when somebody comes to you with a custom order, because I mean, I, I wouldn't even know what to ask for in a pipe other than maybe a general shape. Are these people getting really really detailed in terms of you know? The design and the color and the fit, or like, are they just kind of saying, "Here's kind of what I want. You do, you do your thing." Uh, it's both. It uh, some people are very specific, so much that I'm terrified. You know that <laughs> I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm going to be able to do this. You know, 
Like, hey, let me show you how to make a pipe, and you make it, because I don't think I'm going to do a good job. But, but it's almost just as scary when someone says, you know, here are a few things I like, and they'll send me 18 photos of complete, drastically different pipes. <laughs> and, you know, I trust you. You're the artist. Just make something awesome. Well, I, you know, it's like neither of those are comfortable for me, you know? I mean, so... So do you do, like, a design document for them where you'll... Can you mock it up and, like, you know, Photoshop or something where you can give them an idea at least, or do you just go for it? I usually just go for it, and I'll get their... You know, most of these guys, they call me, they text me, and they email me, so I'll... I'll take photos while I'm working on the pipe. Like I, today, I had a, a guy this morning. I, he, I talked to him on the phone last night, and uh, I told him last night he, we were talking about different colors and different wood adornments and all these options. And he said, "You know, man, you know, tomorrow while you're working on it, why don't you just shoot me a few pictures of different options, and we'll go from there." So this morning, I, I laid out a few different materials and told him what I was thinking. And he's a great customer of mine. He's very reasonable, and he's like, "Yeah, dude, that sounds great. You know, I, I trust you. Go with your gut. What you think looks good." So, you know, I usually I stay in pretty good communication with my clients, and so um, I, I I think twice to my knowledge have I had guys that just got the pipe and didn't didn't love it or did something else with it. You know, I don't know. Right. So out of several hundred pipes, you've only had a couple swings and misses. That's pretty good. Well, again, that I know of. There's probably well, people that's true. out there who they just don't want to tell me. You know? they're, they're telling everybody else. This guy's <laughs> they're telling, this <laughs> great guy. He can't make a pipe worth of shit. Yeah. But I don't think it's an issue with the, the quality. or the. And that's the part that, for me, is so crazy about pipes. Is You're right. At the end of the day, it's a delivery system for some sort of pipe tobacco, whatever you prefer, to get in your body. And yep. the level of people and how, you know, you know, visual and like just aesthetics play into it. Like I'm not really an aesthetics guy, and like I had a conversation with Rob, our co-host, when we were first getting into pipes, and he was like, "Dude, this pipe is shit. This Dracula Peterson, man, this thing is like amazing." Uh -huh. and I'm like, "Dude, it's like, it's like red. I like I couldn't care less." And I was like, "You know what's gonna end up happening?" is I'm going to end up buying a bunch of pipe tobacco because I'm like a nerd about tobacco, and you're yeah. going to end up buying like 20 pipes. And you know what? That's pretty much what has happened. I've bought exactly what happened. about 8 or 9 pounds of pipe tobacco already, and he's bought like 20 pipes. Yep. It's just crazy. I yeah. don't know. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's cool. You know, a lot of the, the pipe guys in the community are nerds about both. Most of them are heavy on one side or the other, um, but I do have a couple of guys that are just, they're so deep involved in both sides, and there's one guy actually, he's whittled his expensive pipe collection down to just just about 100 pipes now, because he just can't smoke all of them. 100 so, pipes? Yeah, and they're all expensive, nice pipes too, but he's been his a lot of he pipe tobacco seller with literally... Tons, the unit of tobacco. Like tons, like th thousands upon thousands of pounds. He has over, uh, well over 3,000 tins. Some of it's from the oh. 1950s, 1930s. No uh, way. Vintage aged, uh, tons of bulk tobacco, you know, when he's into it. Logan's and having a bit of a tobacco gasm. Dude, I am. I thought my eight pounds in about six months was pretty epic. Like, well, but you know what the thing? I don't know. The well, one thing I do like about pipe tobacco is that pipe tobacco. If you buy a tin and you don't want to smoke it, as long as it's not aromatic, you wait about twenty years. You can sell that tin for ten times what you bought it for. And yeah. I love that about pipe tobacco. Cigars, not so much. Yeah. Not so much. Yeah. Yeah. John, we got any more audience questions, buddy? Uh, we got one one audience question, then I have a question. Uh, so, okay. Swede, who's been coming up with some good ones tonight, Swede wants to know if you still play the guitar. I do. Rarely, though. I work all the time. Um, 
I do play the guitar. I have uh, quite quite a number of them, and uh, but my daughters, uh, I've got I've got three daughters and a son, and my my oldest two daughters are 16 and 14, and they they play a lot, and they're actually pretty pretty good. So most of the guitar playing in my house now is my children. It's kind of cool that you can pass it on to them, though. Yeah. Um, I noticed because I was checking out the website and obviously drooling over the you know all the commission pipes you had on there. Which if you haven't checked it out, check out Grant's website, gbatsandpipes.com. Just make sure your wallet is secured somewhere because <laughs> uh, you're gonna want to take something home with you. I guarantee you. Um, but I noticed on there you you do a you do a specifically a pipe making course. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I do. Um, well, the class basically. I teach people how I do pipe making as a business. You know, actually, the nuts and bolts of my processes, my efficiencies. Uh, you know, the a lot of techniques involved, materials, uh, tool making, um, and you know, I started off doing it. it. In fact, I think it kind of became a little bit controversial uh, with a lot of people who uh, didn't understand why I was doing it. Um, so, uh, to kind of speak to that a little bit, um, when I started, you know, I was I was trained by a couple of very good pipe makers for free, and that's generally speaking, that's how this industry. It's a very hospitable, very helping, friendly, uh, just a great community. The, the pipe making community is um, better than most craft. Communities that that I know of and have been a part of. I mean, the guitar industry was certainly not this way. Um, so, the first couple of guys that um, you know, I was very very new to this, and uh, quickly I started getting requests for people to come and work with me and learn what I'm doing. I'm thinking, dude, I'm brand new at this. Why do you want me to show you? Go talk to someone who knows what they're doing. I'm, Figuring this shit out, you know, and uh, no, 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 you know, you're you're really doing what we want. And uh, we've talked to a couple of other people. No one else wants to help or whatever. So, so I, I trained a few people, and then I started getting loads of calls and emails and people wanting information, people wanting wanting to. And I and I tried to help all of those guys, but it became for me very overwhelming. And <laughs> I also realized quickly that the time commitment that of me being in the shop teaching these guys was hurting me financially. You're losing money. So yeah. I started train, you know, I trained a few guys for a little bit of money, and then I realized that, you know, it still wasn't, but financially a sound decision for me. And in addition, the threshold was so low that everyone still wanted to do it and so I kinda had to raise the price a little bit just really to say hey listen first of all this is valuable information because what I'm gonna show you is actually something you could take home and actually make a business out of um, so it shouldn't be a thousand dollars you know it's like it's like going to a miniature like vocational school uh, so anyway that's kinda it that's, that's the evolution of, the, of my pipe school but um, it's uh, I, I have several students a year that come and take it, and um, you know it's a lot of fun, and I, I enjoy it. The students enjoy it, and usually they leave. Uh, the last guy that came, he actually left with six pipes that that we made together. Mostly I made, and uh, right. you know, I mean, he felt he was like, dude, I, I, the pipes were worth it, you know. So, right. um, it's cool. It's it's a cool thing. You know, I don't, I don't really, I don't know what else to say about it. I guess I'll leave it there. <laughs> How many pipes do you make a year? About two fifty. About two fifty. That's, dude. That's still like when you think about it, not that many pipes, like in the grand scheme of things, right? Right. So yeah. would that put you in the in the artisan craft pipe maker? Is that 
on the lower end. I mean, obviously, compared to, like, a Savinelli, like, that's probably what they... That's, like, a rounding error of how many pipes they actually made versus what they did. They they lost that many pipes in the production. But, right. like, with you, like, is that a lot for an artisan person that actually does have a business out of it, not just a hobbyist? Or is um, that on the lower end? I'm just curious. There are a couple of guys that I know of that, that do about that level. Most of the other guys that I know of, the guys that are... Most guys do about 120-something mm -hmm. or less. Okay. So there's some guys that, you know, they might make 70, 80 pipes a year. So I make... For, for the artisan level, I'm making a lot of freaking pipes. And I guess, like, if we... Artisan uh, in terms of quality is tough to gauge, but certainly from what I've seen on the on the internet, your your pipes are certainly considered to be top tier. So, you know, we're talking about a volume of pipes that's higher than say a guy who's doing it on a weekend or whatever as a hobby. But then on top of that, you're talking about pipes that are considered, you know, top tier pipes on top of that. Yeah, and again, you know, that has a lot to do, I think, with. I get to do it for 10, 12 plus hours a day, six, seven days a week. So I'm practicing constantly. I'm getting better every day. I still, I'm still improving. I'm still changing and learning and, you know, improving my techniques and buying new tools that do something a little bit better, a little bit different. Um, and uh, again, I've also invested a lot uh, in the tools that I use. So my tools are. Um, they're capable of putting out high quality stuff precisely and quickly. Yeah. That's so fascinating. So, uh, last question. I mean, we talked about making pipes. What What are some tips that you would have for how to care for your pipes or pipes in general? Like, what will screw up a pipe quicker than anything? Weed. <laughs> no shit. That's why you have a pop can, man. When you're talking about one hole and one other out, I was like, "Yep, you're right." So, but I mean, so obviously, well, yeah, smoking, you know, anything yeah. out of it. But like, like, is it not cleaning them? Is it yeah. using like wrong chemicals to clean? Them? Like, I mean, what, what is it? Yeah, you know, don't use chemicals and stuff. Like, you use you know vodka or Everclear or you know some people use spiced rum because they like the flavor of it. But, um, you know, what I'll do is. When I'm uh, in fact, I'll do it right now because I'm I, I need to I need to clean this thing out. So, whenever you're whenever you're knocking out the tobacco out of here, mm -hmm. never hold it here and okay. whack it. I mean, if you're gonna knock it on something, you know, use a piece of cork or your kneecap or something that's something a little bit soft. You know, palm of your hand, but always hold it by the bowl, never the shank or the stem, and and you know knock it out. And then what I'll do is. You know, I'll, I'll run a pipe cleaner, you know, down it, uh, all the way down, and then, you know, pull it out. And then one, the other thing I'll do is I'll, no I'll, oh, shit, I'll double it over, like okay. this, and I'll... I do the uh, same thing. Yeah, and I'll just kind of twist it around. And, you know, if you do that every time, it's going to, you're going to build up. A, a cake on it, which you want to do because it'll it'll smoke better, it'll protect the, the briar. Uh, but um, if you do that consistently, it's not going to build up those walls super fast. It's going to knock it down a little bit, but you want. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing too, I'll say is, so like if you've got a smooth pipe, um, when it starts getting really dull, just take some olive oil on a paper towel, wipe it on there. And it, you know, it's great for a smooth pipe. Um, mm. And then uh, the other thing I'll say is while you're smoking, a lot of times you'll get some nasty juice going on. I'll take a pipe cleaner and I'll just run it in there and it soaks it up. And you're done, you know. Uh, so I'll go through a handful of pipe cleaners every time I'm smoking. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the other thing that I would say is... Uh, as far as 
what will mess up a pipe real quickly. I, it's a good rule of thumb to have different pipes for different tobaccos and also yep. let your pipes sit and dry out a few days. So a lot of guys will have at least seven pipes. You know, there's a, 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 one of the big things is having a seven-day set so you can smoke a different pipe each day and then come back around Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And the reason for that is this, the, the moisture that's happening, the heat and moisture, if you're just heating it up and getting it moist over and over and over again, it will eventually sour the pipe. And it can actually be damaged to it too. I want to have a handful of different pipes and smoke them, you know, with at least two to three days of drying time. Uh, and then I'll say this other thing too, in terms of tobaccos. You know, I have a lot of pipes, um, and I have pipes for Latakia blends. I have pipes for Virginia blends. Um, some guys go as far as to have pipes for Virginias, for pure Virginia, Virginia Perique, Virginia yeah. Perle. I don't do that. Like if it's a Virginia blend, whatever is in, in it, it's, it doesn't have Latakia. I have pipes then for Orientals, and then I have pipes for aromatics. What you, what you don't want to do is smoke aromatics and Virginias in the same pipe, and it's really not because it's bad. It just messes the flavors up. Yeah. So, if you smoked cherry or vanilla or something in a pipe, and then later you want to try to appreciate someone's saying, "Hey, you know, you should, you should try this, you know, twenty-year-old Virginia Perique blend that's, you know, out of production and it's aged and it's got sugar crystals on it. It's amazing." Well, you're not gonna experience get to appreciate that vintage tobacco if you smoke cherry in that pipe because that it leaves. They call it a ghost. So you left. Yeah. Ghost in a pipe, and so. how do you get that out? I mean, can you get like a like one of those? I mean, I've got one right here, but one of those little things where you can scrape out the bowl. Do you yeah, recommend that? That really doesn't do it because you still got to get the draft hole and the stem. There are actually guys who that's what they do. There are guys that have a system uh, and they hook up like these tubes and they run fluids through it, and it's this whole. <laughs> This, they clean out people's pipes. Wow. Oh, really? And that's their business. That's, yeah. Pretty that's weird. That's crazy. Yep. That's interesting. Well, Surgeon, do we have any more questions? I mean, I know we can keep talking, but we're, we're over we, time here. We, we are over time, and I mean, we could probably talk to Grant for like two hours about pipes, because honestly, man, oh. just, I mean, the tour around the shop was extremely cool, and uh, hearing you talk about pipes is extremely cool, but... Uh, yeah, we've kept you for quite a while, and we certainly appreciate you coming on the show. And uh, I think we're probably going to have to have you on the show in the future. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. be happy to, man. Um, yeah, next time, I'll try to see if I can set it up where I could actually demonstrate a little bit more. With some That'd be pipe. cool. That'd be ridiculous. Pretty cool. That'd be cool. Loud. Are you going to be at IPCPR? Yeah. Okay, so we'll definitely swing by your booth there and okay. um, check it out, do an interview, and see what you got for sure. Cool. Sounds nice. great. Thanks for having me, guys. I enjoyed it a ton, and I'll uh, I'll see both of you guys at IPCPR. It looks like. Absolutely. Absolutely. Dude, we we really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on, uh, everyone. You've been watching Pipe Dummies uh, with Grant Batson, Artisan Pipes, and we'll see you guys next time. Dummies.